Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, prostate cancer genomic uh, signatures and their implication on clinical practice after radical prostatectomy. So first, I want to tell everyone to relax. It's not going to be slides just full of this all day. So first, I want to talk about the problem, uh, post-radical prostatectomy and decision-making. <laughs> Look at classical risk stratification <laughs> for biochemical recurrence and metastasis. Look at genomic signatures that are currently out there. Look at germline mutations and their risk. Uh, the impact of genomic signatures on clinical decision making. Look at some of the economics. And uh, finally, look at genomic signatures and maybe improving um, which patients will even respond to radiation therapy. So, post radical prostatectomy, 30 to 50 percent of patients will recur. Uh, obviously, that depends on many factors. For, uh, um, there's been studies that show that there's benefit of giving adjuvant radiation therapy instead of salvage, but uh, I'll obviously address the inherent flaws that have been fraught in the literature uh, so far. And um, there's significant overtreatment with uh, adjuvant uh, radiation therapy. Inherent in, you know, not all the patients will recur. So the question is who to treat and how can we better stratify patients uh, for treatment? So for adjuvant radiation therapy, you know, traditionally people are looking at T-stage, extracapsular extension, positive surgical margins, Gleason score, and many other things. Uh, classically, it's been uh, clinical pathologic uh, risk stratification. You know, there's many, many different ways to stratify. Uh, you know, D'Amico criteria, CAPRA, NCC, and AUA. And these pull in a lot of what I was kind of talking about before, T-stage, PSA, um, and uh, Gleason score. The CAPRA S also includes um, seminal vesicle invasion, surgical margins, extracapsular extracapsular extension. Uh, so trying to include more detail to have a better risk assessment. So today I'm going to cover a couple of the commercially available uh, genomic signatures, uh, plus one that was developed, the 30 locus genomic classifier. So Polaris, uh, it's cell cycle proliferation index. It was validated uh, in a cohort of 349 conservatively managed patients. Uh, it's prostate biopsy tissue, and how, that's how it was initially developed. Uses RT-PCR, looking at 31 cell cycle genes. Gives a score from negative 2 to 3, negative 2 being low risk, 3 being high risk. Uh, it showed that the cumulative incidence of death was similar for low score patients, and that uh, with a score greater than 2, that there is uh, increased risk of death uh, from prostate cancer. It also, on multivariate analysis, uh, there was a hazard ratio of prostate cancer death, 1.7 per each unit increase in a cell cycle proliferation score. So this is a paper that was published in the Journal of Urology, uh, looking at the prognostic utility of this uh, genomic signature uh, in patients uh, who had a biopsy. It's retrospective, 580-some patients, and took three combined cohorts. One cohort, they did a simulated biopsy, so they already had the tissue, they didn't have a biopsy uh, they didn't have access to the biopsy tissue before the radical, so they just took uh, a biopsy of the main lesion. Obviously, there's problems there. But then there's also two other cohorts that had um, preoperative tissue biopsy. This is showing um, progression of or, uh, progression free survival versus years after radical prostatectomy, trying to, and it's showing that there is some stratification of patients based on the cell cycle proliferation score. The red being patients that are high risk, recurring sooner, and more patients recurring. And the low, if you take a look, at five years, it's about 75% of patients are still free from uh, progression of prostate cancer. Now, if we look at um, metastasis-free survival, really where, what becomes apparent is that the very high-risk patients, the highest risk, um, have more metastasis, and the lower-risk patients um, are metastasis free. So even if they biochemically occur, they don't progress to the point of uh, metastasis being seen on CT or uh, bone scan, the normal uh, imaging modalities. Uh, this table is difficult to see, but essentially it's just showing that um, there was uh, statistical significance for uh, the, the cell cycle proliferation score that Gleason score did, wasn't always uh, significant statistically for metastatic progression, uh, and also pre-radical um, 
radical PSA was important for um, metastatic progression, or sorry, biochemical recurrence. Uh, next, I want to take a look at uh, the 31 locus genomic classifier. This initially uh, originated from a 100 locus genomic classifier that was published in 2014. It was a cohort of 126 patients, low to intermediate risk. Uh, it was validated uh, in this cohort, and then it was assessed in two uh, additional cohorts, total of 270 patients, and it was low and high risk. So they were looking at the whole spectrum of prostate cancer. Uh, DNA from the radical prostatectomy was uh, looked at using microarray technology, trying to look for copy number alterations, essentially looking for uh, how much of the genome was modified. Um, and that would tell them geno essentially genomic instability. And they looked at that to develop the signature. Uh, the hazard ratio for 306 genes uh, was equal to the total number. Um, the hazard ratio for the 306 genes was equal to every single gene that was mutated. So 300 is the pure number to really get the genomic mutation, but they found that 100 uh, was still clinically significant and was shown to predict biochemical recurrence and to be able to stratify patients. So this is a recently published article in European Neurology looking at the 31 genomic classifier. It's looking in a, it's retrospective. There was four cohorts. Um, of previously published patients, and it looked at 563 patients in the cohort um, to assess the 31 uh, genes, essentially. Um, these genes aren't all known cancer genes, but when they did this previous analysis, they um, were agnostic based on, on deciding what genes should be included. It was all about instability, and it didn't have to be a cancer gene if it was statistically significant uh, with biochemical recurrence or progression. So this is Kaplan-Meier curve uh, showing biochemical, recur biochemical recurrence, uh, looking at positive versus negative for the 100 and the 31 genomic classifier, essentially trying to see how it stacks up against the previous model. And it's still showing good uh, stratification of patients by using fewer genes. Now, th this is for the cohort. If you look at the uh, combined group, so this is the low and the high-risk patients all grouped. There's good stratification of patients for bi biochemical recurrence. Uh, and there's a good time interval. It's up to 15 years. So it, it's, uh, it does give adequate time for biochemical recurrence. Then if you look at the low to intermediate group, there is even better separation that patients who are negative uh, or low score for the 31 genomic classifier uh, recur only 25% uh, of the time, whereas high risk, it's about 50%. And then finally, the high risk, Genomic classifier negative, 50% recurred after five years, whereas almost all the patients who were positive for the genomic classifier re recurred after the five years. Uh, so yeah, as I said, 10 year was actually 87, not 85%. Now this is a receiver operator curve looking at, it's kind of a head-to-head -head comparison of the 31 genomic classifier versus our standard clinical pathologic um, risk stratifying tools, Gleason score, PSA, and T stage, uh, showing that combined, it actually works better than what we've traditionally used. Uh, and by itself, it's comparable. Um, and that patients who are positive for the genomic classifier are more often uh, um, upgraded and have a biochemical recurrence. So the high risk patients, the patients who are positive, more often biochem biochemically recur. So um, it is uh, statistically significant and important for the patient as well. Um, now this is from one of the cohorts. Uh, one of the cohorts did have enough time to look at metastasis and did publish that. So uh, this is in the Taylor cohort showing that combined, um, there's improvement in looking at metastasis as well. So not just biochemical recurrence, which may or may not cause uh, significant impact on the patient's life, but uh, disease progression to the point of metastasis, uh, this also helps predict. Next, I want to take a look at Oncotype uh, DX GPS. So it's 12 cancer genes on four pathways, uh, and then they just have five reference genes that they look at. It was developed using prostate biopsy post uh, and post-radical prostatectomy specimen. It uses RT-PCR from uh, uh, fixed sample. 
gives a genomic, um, genomic prostate score 0 to 100, 0 being low risk, 100 being high risk. It was validated in 395 men post-radical prostatectomy, and they were more of your active surveillance cohort, low or low intermediate risk prostate cancer. And the endpoint was uh, initially adverse pathology. So looking at post-radical, um, how many were primary uh, pattern 4 or greater, who anyone who had pattern 5 or end organ confined. So this really was looking at uh, the active surveillance, um, who uh, is high risk for having bad pathology. And it showed that uh, a 20 point increase was significant with adverse pathology. So this is uh, a study from European Neurology. Um, it's the same genomic uh, DX that I was just talking about. It looked at patients between uh, 1990 and 2011 from two US military cohorts. Uh, they looked at 382 patients and these were, once again, your low to, uh, sorry, very low, low and intermediate risk uh, prostate cancer patients, so patients who would be in an active surveillance cohort. Um, and most were, well, they were Gleason 6. Uh, some were Gleason 7, but not primarily pattern 4. Uh, their T-stage was less than or equal to 2. And they had to have a radical prostatectomy within six months of diagnosis. They excluded anyone who had adjuvant therapy. Um, or small focus. And so the, uh, if you look on the left, it's looking at the very low, low and intermediate risk prostate cancer, looking at uh, the, the GPS score to see if there is any stratification. There was shown to be some stratification. Now if you look on the table on the right, uh, it's multivariate analysis. They were showing that the um, Anka type DX score was statistically significant in multivariate analysis compared to um, NCCN risk score um, and between the different cohorts. Uh, this is a paper um, now with the same gr um, uh, group, uh, sorry, my slide just got a little mixed up. Uh, so this is um, you looking at Decipher. Um, this is a retrospective st um, study between uh, 1990-2009, uh, looking at 100 and initially 198 men of 188 met inclusion criteria, all uh, had radical prostatectomies and received uh, radiation therapy. And this is really looking at the adjuvant versus the salvage setting to see if there's a difference. Uh, Decipher uses 22 biomarkers um, uh, and that's what cons consists of the genomic signature. And this is RNA expression um, using formal infix samples. So this is looking at uh, the CAPRA score, so as we talked about, clinical pathologic um, risk stratification. Uh, on the left, it's looking at the low to intermediate cohort, trying to see if CAPRA could help uh, strat separate the patients to see if adjuvant versus salvage therapy uh, was clinically significant. And so this is what traditionally we've been looking at when papers come out saying that adjuvant is better than salvage. Um, so I'm not really showing you anything new here other than they say that there is a statistically significant difference. Now, if we look at uh, adjuvant versus radiation therapy, or adjuvant versus salvage, but we're looking at um, stratification based on genomic signature, for patients who are in the low uh, genomic classifier score, there was no difference between adjuvant and salvage. So if we look back at the CAPRA score, it said that there was a difference. Here it's saying that there is no difference uh, if you do uh, adjuvant or if you do ther radiation therapy right away or later. For patients who are high risk uh, by a genomic classifier, there was shown to be statist statistically significant uh, separation of the cohorts and more patients with high risk uh, uh, score had metastasis. Now finally, this looks at uh, exactly what was the PSA when they recurred, looking at if genomic classifier can help us um, decide when to give therapy. Does it need to be the second you get a recurrence, adjuvant, or can it be a little higher in terms of the PSA? So first is the low genomic classifier. Uh, it showed no statistical significant difference as long as you did it uh, before uh, um, point 0.1, sorry, point, uh, point 0.5. So for the low group, once again, it didn't matter if you did uh, adjuvant or you had a PSA that even had trended up. But if you look at the high-risk genomic classifier score, 
these patients benefited from adjuvant uh, radiation therapy. Patients who had any PSA recurrence uh, did worse than the adjuvant. And then for patients who uh, received radiation therapy after their PSA was greater than 0.05, uh, they did worse than the group that got it at less than 0.05. And there was a 10% increase uh, independently. Um, there was a 10% uh, independent increase in biochemical recurrence. So prostate cancer has many different molecular subtypes. Uh, and I wanted to look at uh, DNA repair defects um, in germline, um, in, in the patient's germline DNA to see how this then affected uh, patient's outcomes. So this is uh, recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It looks at inherited DNA repair defects and risk of uh, metastatic prostate cancer. They looked at seven cohorts. These patients were not selected for family history of prostate cancer. They actively tried to screen for patients who had a strong family history and uh, remove them from the cohort. They compared uh, two of these prostate cancer cohorts. Uh, oh, sorry, they compared the seven cohorts to two different cohorts, one with localized and one with metastatic disease. So this is just a slide showing all the different uh, genes that they found. There's about 20 different genes looking at uh, statistical significance for uh, local disease and for metastatic disease. Taking a look at what's uh, statistically significant, as you would guess, uh, BRCA2 was statistically significant for both localized and metastatic disease. And when you compare the metastatic disease to the localized disease, there still was uh, an increased sub uh, selection of patients who had metastatic disease that had uh, BRC2 mutations. Also, the CHECK2 mutations were statistically significant from the uh, localized prostate cancer and from the metastatic prostate cancer. Now, as I said, there was 20 genes. Um, these were all moderate to high penetrance. 11.8% uh, of the patients in the cohort of localized prostate cancer, oh, sorry, um, of the cohort had um, <coughs> mutations in germline DNA. For the low to intermediate risk prostate cancer, it was 2%. But for the uh, high risk uh, prostate cancer, it was 77, oh, sorry, it was 6%. And then for bad pathology, Gleason score 8 through 10, 70% of those patients had uh, germline mutations. Now, even if they were positive and they were at risk for high-risk prostate cancer, this didn't correlate with so, um, prostate cancer less than age 60 or greater than age 60. Uh, and the odds ratio with mutation in me um, metastatic disease was 5.3, um, with high-risk tumor having an odds ratio of 2.2. This is just showing all the genes, uh, showing that BRCA2, uh, ATM, CHECK2, these are the genes that make up the majority of the patients um, with germline defects. So next I wanted to look at the impact of the genomic classifier on treatment recommendations. So this was 21 urologists uh, in the U.S. from 18 different centers. 38% uh, of the urologists were community urologists. 62 worked in tertiary care centers. They've been practicing for a mean of uh, eight years. And they're all high volume, or for the most part, they're high volume, 180 radicals a year. So uh, a, a, lot of, um, a lot of surgeries, and they deal with this regularly. This was a cohort of 320 patients, and this was looking at using the Decipher genomic signature to see uh, how um, the physicians would change their uh, post-radical prostatectomy uh, uh, decisions. So if, if you take a look, um, so if, let's start with extracapsular extension just to give you a sense of um, how this uh, slide works. So if there was extracapsular extension present, um, you could look at treatment, which is on the left side. So 70%, 77% of patients who had extracapsular extension uh, were given treatment. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry, let me just correct that. Uh, so for patients who had extracapsular extension, um, then it looks at the, um, the decipher score to see if it's low or high risk. So of the patients who were positive, 28% had a low score and 67% had uh, 
had, or sorry, 80. Uh, that math doesn't work, though. Sorry, I'm just going to move on to the next slide. Um, so this is the decipher, and this is looking at the high-risk uh, genomic classifier versus the low-risk. And on the left is before they use the genomic classifier, on the right is after. And this showed that uh, urologists would change their decision uh, based on the genomic classifier. So patients who are low-risk, they were more comfortable with waiting um, to give them radiation therapy or, um, neo, um, or adjuvant deprivation therapy. Um, and in the high risk, more urologists would be inclined to uh, maybe give them the radiation therapy. So this is looking at the economics. Um, these scores or these uh, genomic signatures aren't inexpensive. They can cost up to two and a half thousand dollars US. Um, so this retrospectively look at, looked at um, 100 low risk prostate cancer patients these were very low, low, and intermediate risk prostate cancer patients. Um, and then once, it had that, when, once they had those 100 patients, uh, they prospectively uh, um, approached the patients to include them in this trial. Uh, 80 of those patients were included, and they looked at the cost of including this genomic classifier with um, changes in what the uh, physician would do based on the genomic classifier. Now, all the patients had to be part of uh, um, the Excellus BCBS. Essentially, that's just um, a health, in um, health insurance provider so that they could look at the data to see the cost. So this is um, just kind of showing a little bit of who the patients were. Uh, the patients were, you know, low to mid-60s on average. Um, and there was very low, low and intermediate risk uh, NCCN uh, prostate cancer groups. Uh, so this is very much your active surveillance cohort. Now you can see pre-treatment uh, in the green, or pre-genomic um, classifier in the green and post in the blue. So this is looking at how urologists would change their decisions and in the end we'll look at uh, the financial um, changes with that. So pre-score uh, only 38% of men were offered active surveillance. After the score, 59% uh, were offered. So there was an increased use of active surveillance because urologists felt um, more comfortable having patients being watched closely. Uh, there was a 10% decrease in radical prostates uh, or ra radical prostatectomies, and there was a 13% decrease in use of uh, radiation therapy as first line treatment. Now, in terms of cost, through all the patients, uh, there was $100,000 uh, uh, saved um, if you looked at the cost be, uh, of recommendation before and after the use of the genomic classifier. And that's including the cost of using this test. Now the savings per patient uh, were approximately $2,000. Now one thing, this was only over 180 days. So just to let you know that this is uh, very short in the, um, the natural course of prostate cancer and post-treatment as well. Now, finally, I want to look at uh, uh, stromal gene expression as a uh, predictive signature for metastatic potential in prostate cancer. Um, this is uh, being published currently uh, here. So this is looking at um, patient-derived tumor within uh, a mouse, uh, nude skid mice, sorry. Um, and this is, uh, the sample was initially taken from biopsy uh, of a patient with uh, prostate cancer and multiple biopsies were taken of different parts of the tumor. Now the stroma is mostly replaced by the mouse cells and when they looked at the uh, metastatic potential of these different biopsy sites they found that they were uh, very different. When they looked at a whole genome-wide sequencing and RNA sequencing uh, they weren't able to account for this difference in metastatic potential based on um, the actual tumor cells. So then, you know, the thought is, what else is there that we're missing if we can't uh, explain this difference? So uh, 93 gene stromal metastatic signature uh, was then uh, validated. It was developed and then validated in five uh, large clinical cohorts. There was uh, 856 patients with primary prostate cancer and a high 
score was uh, uh, significantly associated with a worse outcome. So uh, this is, you know, the Mayo Clinic cohort, the Cleveland Clinic uh, cohort, and, you know, it's showing that the probability of metastatic free survival is better with a low stromal signature. So it's showing that you can look at uh, what is around the tumor to figure out if the tumor is going to be uh, aggressive or not aggressive. Uh, and this was true for each of the different cohorts. Um, and this is independent of Gleason score, seminal vesicle invasion, uh, surgical margins, all the usual clinic, clinical pathologic um, data that would normally be used for risk stratification. Now, looking at patients that were Gleason 7, uh, this uh, stromal signature was effectively found to risk stratify patients who are Gleason 7. So this helps pick out the bad actors who um, would maybe be in active surveillance or thought to be um, have uh, curative surgery. Now, th this uh, stromal signature was then compared to other uh, DNA signatures that have been previously published. And uh, it's shown equal, better, and uh, not as good as some genetic signatures. Uh, now, finally, I wanted to look at um, adjuvant radiation therapy uh, and look at genomic signatures to show who would respond to, ad um, sorry, radiation, it doesn't have to be adjuvant, just who would respond to radiation therapy and who doesn't. Um, so this is a retrospective study, uh, multi-centered. Patients were matched one-to-one -one based on clinical pathologic criteria, and the genes I uh, identified were ranked by univariate analysis. So this is searching for who won't respond to radiation therapy or who would respond. And they, they developed a 24 uh, gene signature. Um, this looked at DNA damage, uh, DNA damage with radiation therapy and uh, the immune response. So, you know, it's post-operative radiation therapy outcome, um, outcome, so called the PORTOS score. So with a high PORTOS score, uh, that showed that patients would respond to radiation therapy. So if you look at the score on the left, that's patients who have a high score, so should respond well. Red were given radiation therapy, blue weren't, and they had uh, statistically significant uh, difference in, uh, in recurrence post-radiation therapy. For a low Porter score, that would suggest that these patients, uh, their prostate cancer will not respond to radiation therapy. So these are patients who had this score, even in the setting of where you might be thinking salvage versus adjuvant, they wouldn't respond. So you might be inclined to spare the patient uh, radiation therapy. Is this was radiation alone or combined with hormone therapy? Um, this was radiation alone. Um, so key points, uh, Prolaris, uh, independently associated with biochemical recurrence and metastasis. Decipher, there was no benefit for adjuvant uh, radiation therapy over uh, salvage radiation therapy for patients who had a low score, though patients with a high score may benefit from uh, adjuvant radiation therapy. Oncotype uh, DX GPS independently associated with biochemical recurrence and metastasis. And this was the one that um, was proof of, proof of principle for cost saving. It's a little too short to say that this will save us money, being that it's only 180 days in, in the natural history of prostate cancer. That's very limited. The 31 genomic classifier, one thing to say there is being that this uh, wasn't commercially developed and sold, it only costs $150 um, or when they're doing it um, on a research basis. Uh, and it helps select uh, low-risk patients for de-escalation of treatment. The stromal signatures, it's novel. Um, it's a, an area that'll help stratify patients and identify patients um, who are at risk that maybe a biopsy is missed. And the PORTO score maybe will help or uh, uh, can help um, decide who or see who will respond or not respond to therapy, uh, radiation therapy. So this can help us stratify patients. It can help escalate or de-escalate treatment individualized to the patient, uh, leading possibly to fewer biochemical recurrence, possibly fewer metastasis, and maybe decreased mortality. Obviously it's early, but this is hopefully where the field will go. Hopefully in the future it'll be cost-saving, less patients will be treated, or they'll be treated appropriately. Um, and it's a promising direction for ongoing research. I want to thank Dr. Aglieve, Dr. Black, and Dr. Wyatt for helping with this. And I just want to poll. There's not a lot of, well, I guess there's enough. Uh, so I, 
who here uh, always uses genomic signatures often? No one, okay. Uh, how about we go to the other side? Who here never uses genomic signatures? Okay. Um, patients either on um, active surveillance or post-radical. Uh, what about selectively use? Is it available here? It is, yeah. Which one is it? Polaris. Polaris. Okay, so let's. So if it was available and it didn't cost two, three thousand dollars, and the patient had to pay, do you think that um, you'd use it more? Doctor So says no. Dr. Goldenberg says yes. Dr. Cleve? Selectively. Selectively? Okay. Um, and then, do you think that you would use this more in the active surveillance? Or, I, I guess I was asking, do you use this more in the active surveillance or the post-radical? I'm guessing more in the active surveillance, but both, okay. Okay. Thank you.